pleased to have Adrian here, and he's going to tell us about his favorite falcon. Go ahead. Well, thanks for, for starting where you're from. Yes, uh, thanks for having me here. As I said, I'm Adrian Reuter from Mexico, and I started falconry at the age of 10. And one of my first books had a, a picture of a full crop Merlin in it. And when I, as a 10 year old, I saw that picture, it was like, wow, this is a beautiful bird. And, and there are plenty of pictures of other, other, other raptors, goshawks, peregrines, jurors, etc. But just the, the one of the Merlin actually stuck in my mind. And I said, well, that's a bird that I would sometime like to fly. And after that, I, I really focus on flying small falcons, all my falconry career so far, over 45 years now. And, uh, and I flew uh, bat falcons, kestrels, uh, aplomado falcons, and, and all things, up to certain larger species, peregrines, harvest hawks, and, and other things. But still, my main focus was small falcons. And it took me over 35 years to get my first Merlin. And uh, so uh, I got my first Merlin and I was very unsuccessful with it. I had no clue what I was doing. There were no people flying Merlins in, in Mexico, so I had nobody to ask any uh, guidance uh, to. And uh, so I was not very successful with it. And it took me a few more years to, to meet some people who were Merliners. They were very familiar with the bird. And, uh, and then uh, to get one Merlin in particular, uh, uh, it, it was a, a Columbarius, a female uh, Columbarius, and uh, I named her uh, Muse, Musa in Spanish, because she was uh, an inspiration. That was a bird that I always wanted to try to fly, and it turned out to be a fantastic game hawk. Uh, my best falcon so far, by far, and, uh, and she, she was a very nice bird, and it took me a, a, a while uh, and the way I train her versus how you usually fly Merlins in all places that you catch them, you fly them for a couple of months or three months or so and then you release them back and then you capture another one. In this case, uh, for me, it took me so long to get a Merlin and I was like really having a ball with this one that I decided, okay, I'll keep her and see what I can do next year. And so I first uh, started the first season uh, catching sparrows and implementing techniques that I had never used before. So I, I learned uh, through some friends and, 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 and through some pictures and videos on how the pole lure was being used to condition merlins and train them and I had never ever used a pole lure. I just did the regular lure thing. And uh, so for me that was kind of a wow, this is really awesome, let's give it a try. So I got my pole lure and I got acquainted with the technique and it turned out to be a fantastic tool to make the Merlins like really uh, fly harder uh, to make these uh, bigger loops and that allowed me when they were up there turning to actually close the telescopic lure, uh, pole, hide the lure and then the Merlin was up there and was looking at me like, okay, where's the lure? No? and say, oh, I can do something with this. No? And uh, so I started just doing that, uh, waiting for a few seconds, producing the lure again, and then the Merlin would come. Then I did that and I started walking, waited for a few seconds, a few more seconds, and then produced the lure again. Just extending the amount of time that not showing the lure. And that is how I started to getting this Merlin to wait on and actually to look for the lure while it was up there. And then it was just a process of extending the, the, the amount of time without showing the lure and, uh, and changing the reappearance of the, of the, of the lure for a, a sparrow. No? And so the falcon got acquainted with, I mean, I'm going to be rewarded either with the lure or with a flush. And, uh, and so it was kind of a very natural and easy process uh, to, to get the bird to be very, very focused on what I was doing, if I was walking to follow me at a certain uh, pitch, not very high, but then uh, the bird became to be more proficient and for the first two years 
it was mostly focusing on small birds uh, like uh, sparrows and other things. Uh, where I fly, there are meadowlarks, so meadowlarks were also uh, uh, an interesting prey because she usually wouldn't hit her at the first uh, attempt, but she would go after them, and it was it's a very strong bird, so it was a very interesting flight. And uh, and then by the third year, she started getting interested in doves, and that is when the fun. Uh, began, you know, when, when she really started to focus on morning doves and then I started to practice kind of a micro, uh, you know, waiting on falconry with the Merlin, which for me was awesome, you know, and uh, particularly because I could kind of do something similar to what my friends with the peregrines do, flying ducks or and all things, but uh, with a Merlin, you know, and with, with a morning dove, which is very, very strong, very fast, so it was uh, an experience, you know? And since then, for me, that's my favorite uh, type of falconry right now, from, uh, with Merlins waiting on at morning doves. And, uh, and I think that that shows the power of the Merlin, uh, the skills that a Merlin can get, and you have to have a very fit Merlin to be successful in this type of flight because of, uh, of, of the strength of the, of the doves. And uh, interestingly, uh, this particular Merlin, she was so strong and so fit that uh, I would fly her regularly from a waiting on position. But once I remember this flight that I, I just unhooded the bird, was ready to fly, and, and I said, okay, she's going to fly away, far away, and then come back, you know, like a jeer. Just climbing up, climbing up, and uh, and then you would close the stoop. Uh, but this time, out of nowhere, there were like four or three or four morning doves that flew above us, probably about uh, 200 feet uh, above us, just cruising. And the Merlin, well, we were sitting there, saw them, looked the other way. Blah, blah, blah. When they were like probably like three, four hundred feet away from us, she decided to go after them from the fist, and then. She just went and went and pa 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 pa. It was just amazing the power of the Merlin, just really cutting the distance and making it really shorter. And finally, I I lost them, uh, and then I had to track her down. And sure enough, she was on in the she she had caught one. And so it was like wow. I uh, I, I was so surprised because I had never seen you know that power shown in this uh, in a, in a train mirroring uh, ever, no? And just from the face directly, direct pursuit to cruising morning doves and uh, be successful with it. I, I love Merlins, they're just special birds, they're like a miniature yeah. deer falcon. Absolutely, so for me that, that has been my best game hawk. Uh, I, well, we hunted uh, a variety of sparrows from uh, from mountain sparrows to other types of sparrows, uh, ground doves, short tail uh, doves, uh, the morning doves, of and course. How, how many seasons did you fly this Merlin? And I flew this Merlin for five seasons and uh, really successfully. And unfortunately, uh, after one weekend of flying and hunting and, and, and having lots of fun, the next day I said, okay, I'm just going to rest today. And I was feeding her on my fist, and unfortunately, she, she choked with a piece of, of meat. Oh, you told me about and, this. Uh, and, and it was impossible. It was like far, far too fast, like yeah, only four. It doesn't take them long when they yeah, can't breathe. It was like four seconds, and, and, and unfortunately, she, she was dead. Yeah. You know? so, so sorry, so sad. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I cried, and I, it was a big loss, big, big, big yeah. loss for me. And, uh, but this is a Merlin that uh, with all the people I fly and, and, and the friends who had the opportunity to see her fly, that we keep on talking about, that we remember with a big, big smile, all these good experiences and some bad ones when she just didn't want to come back or she was sitting on a tree and, and uh, it was a big headache, particularly the first year. But, uh, but I mean, this was an amazing bird and uh, and it was funny because after 45 years of, of flying different falcons, it was like, I always go back to that first book, look at the, this picture and I say, wow, so now, now I managed to fly a Merlin. Now I managed to, to make this dream come true. And, uh, and I've been flying Merlins for the past uh, few years uh, and I'm having a ball. And uh, to tell you the truth, there's nothing more exciting than, than flying Merlin. Absolutely. I mean, if I, 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 because of my situation where I'm at, 
I, you know, I've always flown large, long wings, and I used pointing dogs and hunted, you know, large yeah. quarry. But I've always had the, uh, I've always loved merlins, and and wish I had time to to do them and do them well. But to do something well, you have to specialize on that yes. particular bird to really become, you know. Uh, good with them, but I, I just wanted to comment a little bit about you know uh, I have had some experience with birds choking and other falconers birds choking on food and getting it caught in their trachea, and when a bird gets to that they they begin they basically just suffocate, and I was able on two occasions with people's birds where the bird was obviously going to die, you can see it was going to die, and so I said I can't just set it and hold with a bird with both hands. And almost like the Heimlich maneuver type of a thing, you can compress with both your hands a short, quick compression on a bird, and you can force a lot of air out of it. You can actually make it vocalize mm -hmm. if you do it hard enough. And if the bird is going to die anyway, you may as well try this because you might be able to dislodge the blockage. And in both cases that I have tried to do it, I was able to, to dislodge the blockage, and the bird sitting on the ground went from coming from death to coming back alive again yeah. and uh, so I just thought I would share that information so if anyone's watching uh, this uh, this video uh, and they have this, this situation and when it gets to that grim point where the bird is going to die you might as well try absolutely and I think that's a fantastic recommendation yeah. and uh, yeah because it's so fast it's so yeah. quick yeah. and, and then uh, when you can see the bird is suffocating you know that you yeah. don't have time so you may as well try it because the bird will die if you don't do it. Yeah, that's... and there's a chance you can dislodge the food in both in both cases because they have so much air in them, yeah. with all the air sacs and everything. When you really squeeze them hard and sharp, yeah. you force a lot of air out of them, and, and it worked both times. So I, and I had people like thanking me from the bottom of their heart for saving their bird, you know. And I just couldn't stand and watch it die, so I did yeah. something. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you have anything more you want to say? Uh, I appreciate well, you being here and doing this with me. Yeah, or well, maybe just, just for anybody who's interested in flying Merlins, that, you know, the, the equipment is a big part of, of Merlin flying, you know, and uh, yeah. because they are so small, they are so delicate, the feet are delicate, so you have to be uh, very aware that they can get hurt easily. Yeah. For example, the type of lure you use is yeah. very, very important. I've seen many Merlins that that you know, get uh, broken feet because of that, or fingers because uh, the lure was too hard. They hit really hard, and uh, and you'll end up with a with a injured uh, marine. So just be, just be very careful with the equipment you use, uh, soft leather. Uh, you know, like like the lure is important. The hood, uh, obviously, not every hood maker is proficient with really tiny, small hoods, and and. You know, bigger birds might have a little bit more tolerance for for small mistakes, but small birds they they usually don't. No, so and your your bird was a passage. It's a, yes, yes. Actually, this was a bird. It's a passage bird. This was captured by a, a, an illegal bird trader in Mexico, and uh, a, and it was handed to me by the authorities uh, because I'm I'm a registered rehabber, and uh, that's how I got the bird, and I managed to get her. Uh, Flying and at least for a few uh, years, what, like hunting, and, and, and you had wonderful seasons stuff. with this yeah. amazing bird. Absolutely. Well, uh, give me a scenario when you're hunting doves with the merlin. Do you know a field that most likely would have doves, or do you see the doves land? Or hunt? yeah, I'm fortunate that well, like about an hour drive from where I live in Mexico City, there's like a, a, a very open, flat land. And uh, you can actually see the doves land in the different parcels, so you and, know where uh, they are. and so you know where they are, and that makes it perfect yeah. because you can actually plan the flight. And with the merlin up, they hold. Yeah, and so for it, it, it is it is really uh, really the perfect scenario, and and you can just release the merlin and 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 just plan uh, how fast or slow you're going to walk, uh, just to make the flush at the right uh, time without flushing every single dove there because yeah, yeah. If, if if the merlin doesn't hit the first time you she might uh, yeah you, you want one. to give a second one and and in this particular uh, with this particular merlin with 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 musa uh, she would come back for a second uh, uh -huh. time uh, many many occasions and actually one of those that she flew after a dove and uh, was not successful and she was flying back climbing up high again uh, I started walking and I said, well, let's see if there's another dove. And all of a sudden, a killdeer uh, was flushed. And she went after that one like really hard. 
and she managed to get it. So uh -huh. that was unexpected, uh, unplanned, yeah. but it was kind of a very, well, very, is, very well, often interesting hunting, experience. I mean, wild quarry is often unexpected things happen. Exactly. Uh, one other question on your Merlins uh, that you keep for, you know, that you intermew them. How do you intermew them? Do you free loft them? Do you put them on a tethered perch? How do you intermew them? They are on a tethered per perch inside of my house. Okay. Uh, actually in the living so room. So you handle them pretty much through the mold? Yes. Yes. And, and they have molted perfectly. No, no problems at all. And actually, uh, with uh, with a couple of the Merlins, what I've done, I've actually flown them during the molt. Oh, uh, yeah. If you continue flying them yeah. uh, and strong and uh, and really strong, they just the follow the, the the natural yeah. uh, way like of molting. Bird. So just like a wild bird, so they just drop a couple of feathers. You can continue hunting. You can yeah. continue flying, no problem. Yeah. And uh, they'll just this will grow, then they drop, yeah, the, they next drop the next one, and yeah. and uh, and you can fly uh, year round. Yeah. So, I mean, that's also a recommendation for somebody who wants to to to, to continue flying the Merlins. You can do it, no problem. Just make sure that it is a fit, uh, a very fit and well fed bird. You want to have her in high conditions. Merlins, you can fly them in very high condition. Uh, you don't have to starve them at all, and you will have a far better Merlin if they are flying, you know, really yeah, strong robust. And, and, and robust. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your story with me about this wonderful bird that you had, and uh, all of us uh, as falconers uh, have had many birds that we like, but it's, a lot of times there's one bird that's very special to us, and this is what this series is about, a bird that's dear to your heart and that was one of your best. Absolutely. Thank you for hiring me. Thank you.